Leviticus isn't man's attempt to try to appease God. God tells him, personally tells Moses, do this, don't do this, etc. And the first seven chapters focus on five sacrifices. Last week, I, I tried to paint our context, the picture, and that is God has brought his people to the Mount of Sinai and they've received the law. And then God has led Moses and the craftsmen to build this beautiful tent, the tabernacle. And God then, after all these things have been obeyed, God fills, God comes down and fills that tent with his glory. And Moses cannot enter. And so there is this great disappointment at the end of the book of Exodus. Finally, God is going to be again with his people, but his people cannot get close to him. Well, why? Well, simply put, friends, it's our sin. We are born and we choose to be enemies of God. And therefore, we cannot get within any closeness to him without immediately suffering his wrath, which is death. Today's sermon title is Offering Our Sacrifices to the Lord, and really today's theme is sacrifice, a holy and acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. I mentioned at the beginning of our series last week, it's not often you preach from the book of Leviticus. I've never gone through the book of Leviticus in this detail, uh, nor have I ever heard a sermon series on it, but I, I still believe there's value. Well, I know there's value, of course, because it's God's word. All of God's word is valuable. Two, I believe it will help us see God's holiness more clearly and our sinfulness, therefore, more clearly and help the cross grow all the bigger in our hearts as we understand better the great mercy that our God has before us and for us. And I remember the definition of, of mercy. The definition, according to my fancy Apple Dictionary, says compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Let me read that again. Compassion or forgiveness shown to someone whom <clears throat> it is within one's power to punish or harm. Would you stand with me? Open up your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 1 if you're not already there. Uh, and we're going to read the first chapter. I will read it out loud. Please listen closely. Read along if you can. And uh, do whatever you got to do to stay warm. So if you got to do a little dance, you might see me up here high stepping just to get a little blood flowing because I'm already shivering and trembling. Well, let us stand and read in awe God's word. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1 through 17. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. Verse 3, If his offering is a bird offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Verse 5. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces and the sons of Aaron, the priest, priests, shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall also arrange the pieces, the head and the fat and the wood that is on the fire of the altar, but its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water. And the priests shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering, with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Verse 10, if his gift for a burnt offering is from the flock, that is from the sheep or the goats, he shall bring it a male without blemish, and he shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw it its blood against the sides of the altar, and he shall cut it into pieces with its head and its fat, and the priest shall arrange them on the wood that is on the fire of the altar. But the entrails and the legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall offer all of it. Burn it on the altar. <clears throat> it is a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Verse 14. If his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or pigeons, and the priest shall bring it to the altar and wring off its head and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out on the side of the altar. 
He shall remove its crop with its contents and cast it beside the altar on the east side and the place for ashes. He shall tear it open by its wings and shall not sever it completely. And the priest shall burn it on the altar on the wood that is in the fire. For it is a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us again pray. Lord, we pray this morning. We do pray for your mercy. And we don't just shallowly pray that for the, the temperature, although that would be lovely if you were to bring some sun out. But we pray for your mercy. That is your graciousness to us, a people who deserve it not. And we thank you that Leviticus ultimately points to Jesus, to you, our Lord and Savior. For we all here were once sinners, now saved by your grace. And for any of us here today who are not sure whether the blood of Jesus covers us from our sins and forgives and gives us forgiveness through it, through its atoning work, or may today be the first of an eternity of faith, saving faith. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. All right, I'm going to try not to tear my Bible here. <clears throat> Our passage today divides into really kind of five points. So if you're a note taker, I'll do my best to repeat these as we go along. But um, our title again, Offering Our Sacrifices to the Lord. And there are five points I want us to walk through. I want us to see the bones of sacrifice, that the structure, that is, the bones, the meat, number two, which I mean by that, the substance of sacrifice. Three, the heart, the, the reason for sacrifice. Four, Jesus' eternal sacrifice, the true sacrifice. And then last, offering our own sacrifices. So number one, the bones. Number two, the meat. Number three, the heart. Four, Jesus. Five, our sacrifices. Well, again, just to put it in context, because context is so helpful when we look at an Old Testament passage written in, in an ancient language none of us here can read, in a culture so different from ours, with different assumptions and different issues. Exodus precedes Leviticus. And really, if you think again of the first five books of the Bible, they're really like chapters that bump into each other. So again, Exodus begins with Israel being far away from God and his promised land in Egypt. Slaves, both physically, and the New Testament reminds us, even more importantly, spiritually, slaves to sin. And so that million or so people, the Jews in Egypt, God raises up Moses, speaks to him, calls him to be his prophet and his leader. And Moses leads, by God's grace, the people out of Egypt, celebrating the Passover, which we'll talk more of today, and leading them through the Red Sea, parting the, those waters, that incredible miracle that both saved them and destroyed their enemy, all to lead them to worship him at the mount called Sinai. Over and over again, Moses is called to come before Pharaoh and say, let my people go to worship me out at the mountain. And of course, Pharaoh says yes, and then he says no, and blah, 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 blah. And then 10 times, finally, the Passover breaks Pharaoh's stubbornness, at least for a moment, and Israel leaves. <clears throat> Israel gets to the mount, and they cannot ascend the mount. And that was our title for last week's message. Who can ascend the hill or the mountain of the Lord? Nobody could, except for Moses. Moses was called up. People were told, stay at the foot of the mountain. You come any closer, you'll die. So Moses goes up, receives the Ten Commandments. And then the last part of Exodus is Moses receiving the instructions for building the tabernacle. <laughs> so now we see the purpose today of the tabernacle. And that is primarily for the offering of sacrifices. So let us walk then through the bones of sacrifice. Chapter 1. We've already read and heard these words, the Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. The incredible reality, friends, is that Moses is hearing God's voice from the tent. He's hearing God speak to him from the tent as God resides in the Holy of Holies, above the, the ark, the wings of the cherubim there. And it's said, if my, if my math is right, over 80 times Moses 
hears these wo- or, or records these words. The Lord called and spoke to him. So Leviticus is an incredible book verbally told to Moses. He's essentially capturing what God has told him verbatim over and over and over. And so we see these words dozens and dozens of times, and the Lord spoke to Moses. The implications, friends, of this are clear. The book of Leviticus isn't man's attempt to figure out how to please God. God tells him. Again, Leviticus isn't man's attempt to try to appease God. God tells him. Personally tells Moses, do this, don't do this, etc. And the first seven chapters focus on five sacrifices. We are going to focus on the first one because it is the most detailed. And you'll notice if you read through this on your own that it is assumed then in the next four. So our focus today is going to be on the burnt offering, as it is called in chapter 1, verse 3. Now, the burnt offering could be a bull or a sheep or a goat or a bird. The next offering that begins in chapter 2, verse 1, is the grain offering, which would be a, a fine flour milled mixed with oil and frankincense. The third offering would be a peace offering, chapter 3, verse 1, which could be a male or female lamb or goat. The fourth offering, a sin offering, chapter 4, which varied depending on whether it was an individual leader offering a sin offering, or if it was a common person like you or me, or if it was for the whole congregation. And we see this several times throughout the Old Testament. That would dictate how the sin offering or what was to be offered, but nevertheless, there were rules for that, and it's captured here in chapter 4. Chapter 5, verse 14 is our last of the five offerings, the guilt offering, and that was to be a ram from one's own herd. Again, we focus on chapter 1 here because it is the most complete, and it is also the first for a reason. It is our ascension offering. You could even translate that word that way. It is how we come into as sinners to the presence of a holy God. It is interesting, and it's obvious, but I'm going to point it out. Notice, you have to make your offerings at the tabernacle. In fact, to not do so, according to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 4, is banishment from God's people. So, Unlike the Passover, which would be annually celebrated at your home, you must make your other offerings at the place where God dwells, at the tabernacle. As uh, one author puts it, the tabernacle then, friends, becomes both the place where God resides, his his house, and it becomes the the way in which we encounter him. So it's, it's both a place and a path. The tabernacle is both a place and a path. Now, let's turn our attention to the meat of the sacrifice. What were you supposed to do and why? First, notice, the sacrifice must come from your own herd or your own flock. So, and it must be a male. So you must provide from your own means, Again, most of these people owned animals of various sorts, you must provide you can't just grab, you know, one you, you got off you know, that you found in the wild or or maybe one of your neighbor's goats kind of wandered over and you're like, eh. no, no, it needs to be from your own provision. It needs to cost you something. Sacrifice needs to cost you as the worshiper something. Two, notice it needs to be a male and a male without blemish. So if you were frugal or... Uh, Greedy, you might even say, or or overly worried about your money, and, and, and you you didn't want to give up your prize bull. God's God God wouldn't accept your sacrifice if it was the old the old bull in the herd that was going to die in a couple of weeks, or if it was a deformed you know lamb that you wouldn't wouldn't want to breed from. No 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 no. It had to be a male, and it had to be essentially perfect, without blemish, without <clears throat> without any deformity. Verse 3 and then into 4. The owner then, bringing up his bull or his lamb or his goat, male, either way, or birds, must put his hand on the head of the animal before it's killed. And then it would be, notice verse 4, accepted 
for him to make atonement. And we're going to flesh out atonement in a bit. But so you lay your hands on the animal. And at the very least, I think it's a sign of ownership. This is, this is mine and I'm sacrificing it. But I think you could also argue there's some sense of identification because this is eventually what we call substitutionary atonement. And we're going to unpack that in a little bit. But at, at the very least, it's ownership and it's probably also a sense of identity. I'm identifying with this animal and it's going to do something, thankfully, I don't have to do. And that is die. <clears throat> and then, therefore, it is acceptable to the Lord. Now, what do I mean by atonement? Atonement can mean two things in the Old Testament, but here it means to pay a ransom price. So if you're a note taker, write that down. To pay a ransom price. So if you watch any any cop shows or any, or if you're familiar with the news, or you're old enough to know, often we think of ransoms, we think of kidnappings, right? Whether it's a terrorist or somebody else, that they, they take a person and they say, you cannot get this person back unless you pay me whatever it is, or do whatever I do. You have to ransom them. There has to be an exchange. <clears throat> but ours is even a little different than that. It's a substitutionary ransom or atonement. So here, you're bringing forward your, your spotless lamb, and that lamb will be killed in place of you. It's being a substitute for you. <clears throat> The Israelites were, of course, very familiar with this. As we mentioned a little earlier, the Passover lamb. You remember God's wrath is being poured out on Egypt, and the firstborn son and the firstborn of all the flocks and herds are going to die that night unless they are covered by what? The blood of the lamb. Unless the, a lamb has been slain for them. A male unblemished lamb has been slain on their behalf. Substituted. Passed over. It's interesting, our word for atonement adds another aspect that's absolutely true. It, it literally is a phrase that became a compound word. So it was Old Latin transferred into Middle English, and it, it was at one meant, was the actual phrase. At one meant. The, the idea here is unity, being at one or together. And, and so <clears throat> atonement, or substitutionary atonement in our context here, brings unity between a holy God who is hostile towards us because of our rebellion. An atonement, a substitutionary atonement, the shedding of blood can bring a unity that could not have been there prior to it. Now, the instructions then are fleshed out here in verse 5 through the, through the rest here of this particular offering. Notice, the owner has to kill the animal. The owner takes his knife, slices the juggler, or however you do that. I, I'm a city it, I don't know. But you kill it, and it's messy. <clears throat> and the priest collects that blood while you cut up the carcass. And the priest takes that blood and throws it at the altar. And there's a great deal of conjecture on what that might mean, but at the very least, again, this is blood, this is payment, this is covering at some level our sin, the, the, the worshiper's sin who's making the offering. So he's cutting this up, preparing it, to be wholly burnt. And that's why this is called a burnt offering. In other offerings, the priests may have a little bit, or you and your family may have a little bit of the meal, as is the Passover meal is. But here, everything is consumed. It's wholly offered up as a sacrifice to the Lord. So the worshiper is cutting up the animal. The priest is getting the blood on the, on the altar. It is gross in our sensibilities, but extremely common back in the ancient Near East. And the priest is also getting the fire going to burn the offering, verses 7 and 8. And finally, the priest then takes the entrails, the goods, as the old Scots would say, and he cleans them off. Well, why is he cleaning off the guts and, and, and the legs? Well, it's to get the excrement off there, the poop, kids. It's to clean it up. You wouldn't put that and offer that, that, that gross stuff to God. No, it's got to be clean. So that's being cleaned off. All these are being obeyed thoroughly. And then the priest puts the offering and all its pieces on the fire and it is burnt. The fire, of course, is not in the tabernacle. It's not in the tent. It's just outside. It's just east of the entrance into the tent. And yes, there is definitely imagery here of Eden. Remember, Adam and Eve, 
were sent out east of Eden and the garden was shut to them. That is, the presence of God was no longer available to them. And here we come, the old Israelites coming towards the tent, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, or east of Eden, coming back closer to the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> and in the end, it's deemed a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Now, no doubt we love barbecuing in the summer and cooked meat always smells good. But that's not the point. That's not the point at all. It's not the physical smell, although I'm sure those were there. But it's that the worshiper, the sacrificer has honored God in obeying his word by faith, of course. And God is pleased. And their relationship is restored. We'll unpack that here now. We get to the heart of the sacrifice. Why, Pastor? Why are we going through Leviticus? Well, because it teaches us about the heart of sacrifice of our Lord and of what we are called to sacrifice in our own lives. And sacrifice has a long history in the Bible. But what comes before sacrifice is something we must remember, and that is covenant. And what is covenant, Pastor? Well, covenant is God's inhuman ability to keep his promises no matter what. These are my words. This is not a fancy theological definition here, but a covenant is God's inhuman ability. That is something we cannot do. He keeps his word to the end, no matter what. And Alec Motyer, one of my favorite authors on this subject in his book, <clears throat> helps us flesh out how covenant and sacrifice are seen through the Old Testament. So I want to walk through this so you see the thread we talked about last week. And we'll end it with the New Testament, of course. So, covenant begins because God wants to rescue his world from their sin from, and death and the chaos. Covenant begins because God wants to rescue a people from their sin and from their death and from their chaos. And we see this first in the story of Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. God fought, now Noah, it says, Noah finds favor, literally finds grace, in God's eyes. And then Noah is noted as righteous. It's not the other way around, friends. Noah wasn't better than anybody. Rather, God chose to show favor <coughs> to Noah. And Noah responds in obedience. Boy, that's a key observation. That slays in us the heart of legalism. The idea that we can somehow be good enough. Nope. It's not an option. Never was. Got to have some warm coffee this morning. Hmm. So Noah's given grace <clears throat> and Noah is saved through the ark as is his family and all the animals. And what does Noah do when he gets off the ark? He offers up every, uh, a portion of every clean animal as a burnt offering, a burnt offering <clears throat> to the Lord. And God then gives Noah a sign in chapter nine to say, I'm keeping my covenant with you, Noah. And there'll be a sign in the clouds after every rain. And that is the rainbow that we still see today thousands of years later. The covenant continues. It moves on to Abraham in chapter 12 and following. And remember, I've mentioned this, uh, I think, last week a little bit and before. Chapter 15 of Genesis is, is incredibly insightful into the nature of covenant because God tells Noah, hey, cut up these animals, line them up in a row so that the blood is a path in between the animals. And as Noah, or as Abraham has kind of fallen asleep, there's this flaming pot that, that floats right down the river of blood. And, and a covenant, when you cut a covenant, a business deal in the Old Testament or in the ancient Near Eastern world, you would agree upon whatever the terms were, and then you would shake. Men would often grip each other in the groin, essentially, to shake on it. That's something I'm glad we don't do today. <clears throat> Amen. But the point was, and you sometimes would, would, would cut animals open, and you would say, if I break this covenant, May I be like this dead animal? Well, in chapter 15, God shows us the, the nature and the, 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 if you will, the insanity of God's commitment. He's the only one who walks that covenant. It's a unilateral covenant. It's not a two-way. It's a one-way. God's making a commitment to Abraham and his descendants, both physically and spiritually. That's us, by the way, spiritually. He's going to be committed to seeing his people <laughs> to the end. 
Now, man, God promises Abraham the land <clears throat> and the promised land where they're so far away from it. And Abraham is ultimately tested, ultimately tested in chapter 22 when God says to him, I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac, as a burnt offering. Those are the words, burnt offering, holy killing his son. And of course, God never intended for Abraham to do that. That's obvious. But Abraham, by faith, Hebrews tells us, believed that God could have raised Isaac from the dead, so he's not worried. And God, of course, provides a substitutionary atonement for Isaac in a ram, caught in the thicket there. And Isaac lives, and Abraham's faith is tested and proved. And, and God can, continues with his covenant promises to Abraham. And through Abraham, then we come, last but not least, in our Genesis account to Moses. We've already mentioned it, so I'll be quick. Moses leads his people out of slavery through the waters to the mount where they get the law, and then God instructs them how to build the tabernacle, and then we're outside the door with Moses wanting to come in and be with our God. But thankfully, Leviticus provides a way. And have you noticed what that way is, friends? That way is substitutionary atonement. Blood. Not ours shed, thankfully, because God is merciful. But the cost at the cost of another's life, can we enter into relationship with our Creator? And ultimately, Jesus becomes the great sacrifice, the eternal sacrifice on our behalf. You'll notice this in every week, I hope, every sermon that we have in this series, you're going to see how the Old Testament is the shadow of the real. Just as if on a bright sunny day, which today is not, there would be a shadow cast of this tree or of, of this stand. And that shadow isn't the real thing, although it, it looks like it. It represents it at some level. So too with Jesus. The Old Testament, and we've just barely skirted the, the sacrificial system here in Leviticus. Not done it much justice, to be honest. So there's far more depths to plumb. But I hope you see the, 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 uh, the, the, the shadows of Jesus' sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 1 in the burnt offering. Well, let me be a little more clear, and I'm going to lean on another author here who summarized this so well. <clears throat> the Israelite sacrificer, the worshiper, would bring an animal that was unblemished. And of course, our Jesus was unblemished, free of sin, <coughs> not deformed no whatsoever. First Peter chapter 1 reminds us of that. <clears throat> Two, how was Jesus better? Well, his atonement wasn't just once or wasn't just every year or needed every day it's once and for all permanent and eternal romans chapter 3 point four or point three excuse me jesus cleansing of us is complete again the old testament system sacrificial system was something repeated over and over and over again but Jesus is able to wash us clean once and for all. 1 John 1. <clears throat> His blood was poured out once and for all. Hebrews chapter 10. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was our whole burnt offering. He held nothing back but gave up his life for us. And that sacrifice of Jesus was pleasing, a pleasing aroma to his Father. Ephesians 5 verse 2. As the author of Hebrews notes, and you'll hear this passage quoted several times in this series, Jesus was both our priest and our sacrifice, perfect in both accounts. And all that we need, all that you need for salvation and eternal life. Hebrews chapter 10 reads, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So one of the sisters and I were talking this morning, and she was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to learn how, how Leviticus will help me improve. And I, I said to her, the good news is, you don't have to. Jesus has already been the perfect sacrifice for you. Yes, we are to grow in sanctification, but we have already been made holy and pure and cleansed before our Lord. 
written by his work. Or as the author of Hebrews reminds us in, later in that chapter 10, verse 18, where there is forgiveness, there is no longer any offering for sin. So each Sunday, we don't sacrifice Jesus again. It's done. It's paid for. It's complete. And it's accessed by belief, by faith. Not by doing, but by believing. But last but not least, Pastor, you say, well, what do we do? How do we offer our sacrifices to the Lord? Well, the New Testament picks up on these themes in at least three books. It's way more, but I limited it to Romans, 1 Peter, and Hebrews. So while we do not offer sacrifices to save ourselves, Jesus has done that. Amen? Amen? Yeah, amen. Yet we are called and we can live for him in ways that show the world that we are Christians. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. What are those mercies? Well, the sacrifice of Jesus. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by testing. You may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That is a passage to dwell on this week and mull over. <clears throat> Notice we respond in worship and in obedience, not to earn God's love, but because he has already given us his love. And we offer up our bodies. There's nothing God can't ask of you or me in Christ. Do you want my life, Lord? Take it. It's yours. And I can't pull up Jim Elliott's quote off the top of my head, but it's something like, he is no fool who would give up his life now for an eternity with Jesus. It's not even a remotely fair exchange. Two, <clears throat> so at first we, we serve because there's nothing Christ can't ask of us because he gave his all for us. Two, we walk in holiness then, friends, not in sin, living lives of obedience that marks us as different changed people. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, friends, you have been healed. And last but not least, we do good. The life of a Christian is not just what you don't do, but what you do do. So the opposite of, of sin then therefore would be love and sacrifice and service. And so Hebrews reminds us of this. Through him, that is Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So hear these words, brothers and sisters in Christ. Do not neglect to do, do, not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So we not only sang this morning, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And that is true. It is absolutely true. But because he lives, there's nothing God can't ask me to do. There's a life of holy obedience that we're called to live as shining beacons in a dark world. And to use our gifts and what we have to bless others around us, especially the family of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our hope. You are our sacrifice. Once and for all, paying for our sins. Paying for the guilt that we know we have. <laughs> this morning I pray against the accuser, the devil, who loves to point out <clears throat> our sins but offers no comfort. Jesus, through your Spirit, be a comfort to us as we confess our sins to you this morning, as we acknowledge the ways in which we've not walked in obedience that you bring to our hearts. <clears throat> or if another brother or sister is, has called us to account or to, to walk according to the Word and not to the flesh or the world, Lord, I'll let us respond and thank them for the love they've shown us. Lord, and as we, as we gather this summer to walk through your word in Leviticus, to see your holiness and our sin. May the cross grow greater in our hearts. 
May your love grow deeper and richer, getting into our mold and our bones, our very marrow, and causing us to offer up our lives as sacrifices. Because of your, your incredible love for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.